Hello, and welcome to this textbook chapter on nasal septum and turbinate disorders. I'm Michael Stewart from Wild Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. And get started. I have nothing to disclose. So we're going to be talking about uh, the anatomy of nasal airflow, the assessment of nasal obstruction, deviated nasal septum, the role of the inferior turbinate, a little bit about the role of the middle turbinate, and then some readings and sources. This is not a how I do it chapter on the technical details of septoplasty surgery, but we're going to spend more time talking about assessment uh, and, uh, and outcomes, although we will talk about the surgery. So nasal airflow. Uh, everyone who's reading this uh, chapter or watching this chapter should understand the basics of, of nasal anatomy, but let's talk about those basic structures. These are coronal CT scans here, and we're going to focus on the nasal cavity visualized here. Here's the anterior septum. Here's the very uh, anterior portions of the inferior turbinates. As we go back more posteriorly, you see the inferior turbinates get larger, and then you see the middle turbinates start to develop. Uh, farther back, you've got your sinuses, of course, around the nose. You've got the septum back to the bony portion of it now um, with middle and inferior turbinates, and then very far posterior, you get to the coenum. The lateral wall of the nose, this is a cadaver section, um, and this is the inferior turbinate. This is the middle turbinate. This is the superior turbinate. Here's the nostril. Here's the area of the, the nasal valve, uh, nasal vestibule, and here's the concha. The question is, where does the air actually flow? Does the air just flow like a sheet through a straight, or does it flow equally through every one of these air spaces in the nose? Well, people have actually done work on this. They've actually done flow dynamics, fluid dynamics. They've done computational modeling. They've built actual anatomic models of nasal cavities and pushed air through with different sorts of markers in the air to measure flow, et cetera. So this has been done. And this is, uh, I'm gonna show uh, a representative example, but basically uh, all the studies show similar findings. This is a single sagittal cut. Remember that the airflow is going to be different depending on how far lateral or medial you are in the nose. This isn't necessarily right next to the septum, for example. But on this single sagittal cut, blue represents very little uh, turbulence, and uh, the red represents high turbulence and high flow. And what you see here is at quiet breathing, there's not much turbulent flow. Uh, when you increase the rate of breathing, uh, an increased breathing rate here, what you start to get is some increased flow and turbulence here anteriorly near the edge of the inferior turbinate and then flowing superiorly over the middle turbinate, uh, the inferior turbinate, and then also under the inferior turbinate. But when the flow increases, what you see is more flow actually goes, oops, uh, more flow actually goes above the inferior turbinate than below. Now, this is, again, a single sagittal slice. If you put this together into a three-dimensional model, this is kind of looking from an oblique angle. This is not lateral, and it's not anterior. It's kind of looking partially from the side. So here's the two nostrils right here, and here's the, here's the nasal uh, shape right like this. What you see here is this flow comes in through the nostrils. There's high levels of flow volume right here in this area of the nasal valve. And then the majority of the air actually flows up over the inferior turbinate. This, this purple space here is the inferior turbinate, and this purple space here is the middle turbinate, and there's no air flowing through the solid portion of the turbinate. More flow actually goes over the inferior turbinate and next to the middle turbinate than it goes under the inferior turbinate. So this is your area of maximum airflow. Nasal valve, head of the inferior turbinate, over the inferior turbinate, under the middle turbinate. And so to show this uh, uh, pictorially, this is a smaller view of this exact same uh, coronal uh, cut. And I've drawn in here where this area of maximum nasal airflow is. This is where the air wants to go at maximum velocity. Not down here along the nasal floor and not up high in the nose. It's right in this area, inferior to the middle turbinate, um, and then medial and, and uh, superior to the inferior turbinate. This is your area of maximum airflow, which is the area you need to address when it comes to septoplasty uh, uh, surgery. Now, how do you address, uh, assess nasal obstruction in a patient? Uh, certainly, you assess the patient's anatomy, and external deformities can, uh, can cause problems here, deformities of the nostril, the nasal valve, et cetera. 
In this chapter, we're covering the nasal septum and the, uh, the, nas and the nasal turbinates, um, particularly the inferior turbinate, but we'll cover the, cover the middle a little bit. The septum does make up some of the anatomy of the internal nasal valve. Also, other things can give you nasal obstruction like masses, synechia, atresia, et cetera. That's not being covered in this chapter. It's very clear that you cannot rely entirely on the patient's symptoms. Some patients come in reporting that they have obstruction or blockage in their nose, but they're actually perceiving something else. They actually don't have an obstruction. So they must have an anatomic problem. And clearly anatomic assessment is very important. But we've learned that I'll show you more on this. Anatomic assessment does not fully describe what the patient is feeling. What people tried for many years to do was come up with a standardized way to assess the internal nasal anatomy so that when we could assess the internal anatomy, we could therefore objectively measure what the patient was feeling, how obstructed they were. And what was found consistently was two things. First of all, there's variation in how to interpret the results of these objective analysis. And second of all, it doesn't correlate very well with what the patient's actually feeling. So things like acoustic rhinometry, rhinomanometry, CT volumetric uh, calculations, et cetera, those are all possible and they are ways to actually measure the area under the curve and things like that to sort of assess the relative nasal airway in different areas. The problem is that all these assessments, first of all, there's not consistent agreement on how to interpret them. And second, even when there is, they don't correlate with what the patient is actually feeling. And if you think about that, that makes some sense. These volume and area measurements are basically measuring size. You can make those measurements look better by simply taking tissue out. But if you remove all the tissue from inside the nose, patients actually get a paradoxical sensation of blockage or congestion or the empty nose phenomena. So more isn't necessarily better. Uh, and in fact, simply measuring the anatomy doesn't tell you everything you need to know. It does turn out that a flow, uh, uh, an assessment that can be done called peak nasal inspiratory flow, which is done with the flow meter, that number measured objectively does partially correlate with what the patients subjectively feel in terms of their nasal obstruction. So if you're going to use an objective measure, peak nasal inspiratory flow is the way to go. And at the end of the day, the patient is coming to see you because they have a symptom of obstruction. They feel blocked in their nose. If, you, if they also have an anatomic problem, then it's really the symptoms you're wanting to address. Uh, not to be too tongue in cheek about this, but patients don't come back saying, you know, doctor, I feel fine, but I'm worried that the curve on my acoustic rhinometry might be a little abnormal. Patients don't worry about that. What they want to feel like is that they're breathing. So the symptoms are actually the most important thing. For many, many years, we didn't have a validated patient-based measure to measure nasal obstruction. People used visual analog scales, and that's a perfectly valid way to assess symptomatic obstruction. And it, it has been used in the past and it's still used today. Everyone felt that objective data had to somehow be important. But again, uh, there's no agreement on how to access it or how to correlate it with what the patient's actually feeling. So that leads to the development of the nose instrument. And I'll tell a little story here about how this happened. So Dr. Jonas Johnson, a uh, very well-known head and neck surgeon, was the president of the American Academy of Laryngology Head and Neck Surgery in the year 2003. He wanted to make a hallmark of his presidency that the academy start to lead multi-center patient-based outcomes assessments so that we could choose in otolaryngology some of the things that we did and be able to systematically measure the outcomes of these common treatments to prove that what we did was beneficial, but also to potentially assess whether uh, we could compare different treatments for better outcomes, et cetera. He envisioned that we would build a network of, uh, uh, of these sort of studies and that we would be able to build evidence of successful treatments at ENT with a network of providers who are enrolling their patients in prospective studies measuring patient-based outcomes to show that what we did was beneficial. At the time, I was the chair of the Outcomes Research and Evidence-Based Medicine Committee of the Academy, and he reached out to me and my committee to say, can your committee help us design some studies which the Academy will help support to sort of prove that this is possible? Enroll doctors and patients from multiple parts of the country in these prospective trials measuring patient-based outcomes. So, we discussed amongst ourselves and we said, what's a good first study to do? Well, actually, there really wasn't good evidence that septoplasty actually worked to correct nasal obstruction. We knew that it worked because patients were happy with the results, but there wasn't a study demonstrating it uh, uh, very clearly, certainly not a study using patient-based uh, outcome measures. 
So what we decided to do was to do a multi-center study measuring the effectiveness of septoplasty. And we decided that the primary outcome measure should really be a patient-based validated outcome measuring, measuring nasal obstruction. So we planned to do this multi-center prospective study, but first we needed an instrument. So we developed the uh, nasal obstruction symptom evaluation scale, the nose scale. Uh, and you can read here on this abstract from the paper, which came out in 2004, we did a standard instrument validation. We started with an alpha version with a whole lot of possible instruments that might be important that we gathered from focus groups with patients. We then analyzed those data. We eliminated extraneous items. We got the item down to a beta ver the instrument down to a beta version. We tested uh, reliability, all the things you, you measure, test, retest, reliability, internal consistency, reliability, et cetera. And we actually created a valid instrument uh, that was responsive uh, and reliable, that was brief and easy to complete, that measured subjectively the patient's sensation of nasal obstruction. This is what the nose instrument looks like. It's five items measured from each from zero to four. We normalize the scale to 100 typically, simply for comparison between uh, different studies. And so a higher number means more obstruction. And then after we did this validation study at the four academic centers, we did a prospective outcome study at 14 sites with 16 investigators. Four of those were academic sites where we had also enrolled patients for the validation. Um, and then 10 were in uh, private practice uh, sites. We screened 158 patients, 62 were eligible. We ended up having 59 who had surgery. You can see the demographics there. It was a prospective observational study. There was no control group. There was no sham surgery. Um, we let the surgeon and patient decide if they were going to have a turbinate reduction or not. And the data was collected. The data were collected from the patient by mail or email centrally at the Duke Clinical uh, Research Institute. Uh, the academy had a contract with the, uh, the DCRI to help us uh, administer the study. So the surgeon enrolled the patient, got the consent, asked the patient if they would agree to be assessed before and after the surgery, and then gave the patient a packet. The patient completed the instruments and mailed them off to the DCRI. The surgeon never saw the results of the instruments. The surgeon did whatever surgery they felt they should do. The patient had their usual recovery. And then at three months and six months, the DCRI would, would mail or email the patient um, a, uh, uh, the, the subsequent nose studies at which they would complete and send back in. And we had those data available for analysis. These were the 14 clinical investigation sites, which was a nice geographic spread across the United States. And this is the results from the study. Patients started off with high scores on the nose instrument, and they had significant improvement at three months and six months. Uh, and they did a little bit better if they had septoplasty with partial reduction of the inferior turbinate. And if you put all the patients together, these are the results that we found. Now, this is not a, a randomized control trial. Uh, it doesn't include a sham arm. Um, and uh, uh, so this study is not perfect. But in fact, it does demonstrate using a validated instrument that nasal septoplasty with or without Turbinate, uh, turbinate reduction does result in significant improvement in the patient's subjective nasal obstruction. Now, interestingly, we developed the nose instrument basically to be able to do this study. It's subsequently been used many more uh, times, and frankly, it's been used more widely than I thought it would be. It's been used to compare different turbinoplasty techniques. It's been used to, to measure the effectiveness of nasal valve surgery, to measure the effectiveness of rhinoplasty, to measure uh, nasal polyp treatment, either medical and surgical. And in fact, it's now been translated into 16 languages and is used around the world. The most recent is the Thai language. So it actually has, uh, has become an important clinical tool that people are using because it's a validated instrument. And we have a lot of baseline data on the level of obstruction from different conditions and how much improvement you might expect, uh, for example, after correction of nasal obstruction. So, if you're thinking about subjective nasal obstruction and uh, subjective assessment and objective assessment of nasal obstruction, we really know that there's minimal correlation with various volume and area assessments. There's some correlation uh, with the, uh, the PNIF, which I mentioned. Uh, but in fact, there's also minimal correlation with surgeon assessment. The design of this study enabled us to do an additional analysis. Since the study was prospective, Every patient in the study had a septal deviation. They all had symptoms. And the surgeon didn't know what the patient's nose score was. The surgeon was also asked to anatomically assess the severity of the anatomic obstruction. And there was a standardized scale we used, whether you could see part of the middle turbinate, none of the middle turbinate, et cetera. So it was either mild, moderate, or severe. 
we went back and we did a, sub, uh, a secondary analysis where we actually looked at the nose scores in patients that the surgeons had rated mild, moderate, and severe anatomic obstruction. And what you see here is that in fact, the surgeon's assessment of anatomic severity did not predict the patient's nose score. So you can't look in someone's nose and say, oh, that's a really severe de uh, deviation. I'll bet that nose is really, I bet that patient's nose score is really high. These patients all had high nose scores and they all had septal deviations, but you can't look at the anatomic severity and predict the degree of symptomatic severity, which is somewhat surprising, but actually this find it's surprising initially, but this finding has been borne out in many, many other uh, similar types of studies. So now let's talk about addressing nasal septal deviations. Here's the nasal anatomy. Um, uh, from a sagittal view, you've got the quadrangular cartilage here, you've got the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, the bomer bone. Uh, these all come together underneath the mucosa. You've got uh, your membranous septum here, uh, a portion of the uh, lower lateral cartilage. Um, and you've got here your, your upper lateral cartilage just demonstrated these attach, the septum of course attaches to the nasal bone, uh, to the upper lateral cartilages, to the Max, the crest of the maxilla, the crest of the palatine bone, et cetera. We saw from our flow diagrams that in fact, um, the areas that the nasal septum can contribute to nasal obstruction are the antero-inferior area, including the col uh, columella, the area of the nasal valve, and the mid portion of the septum affecting that high flow area near the anterior uh, edge of the middle turbinate. And basically the way to think about this is if you can't see the middle turbinate on anterior speculum exam, that's a clinically significant septal deviation. And that's the area you really wanna focus your surgery on. You should also assess the inferior turbinates because clearly turbinate hypertrophy also affects the nasal valve and it also affects a very high flow critical area for, for nasal airflow. And I believe you should assess the patient for inferior turbinate hypertrophy before you decongest them. Once they're decongested, the turbinates don't usually look enlarged at all. So be sure and make that assessment before decongestant. And then if you're gonna decongest the patient to do endoscopy, you've already noted the baseline state of turbinate hypertrophy. You can do nasal endoscopy to get a better assessment of the nasal septum farther back in the nose. And with most septal devia deviations, it's actually important because with anterior endoscopy, you can't fully see behind the deviation. So nasal endoscopy can be helpful to give you a fuller assessment of the nasal anatomy. This is a CT scan of a patient with septal deviation. The patient also has some sinus disease, ignore the sinus disease. But here's a picture of a patient with a significant septal deviation to the left. You can appreciate that here. You can also appreciate here on these coronal CT scans, this degree of inferior turbinate hypertrophy of the right compared to the left. And then on some axial scans here, you can see this deviation at the cartilaginous bony junction that's almost always anterior to the head of this middle turbinate. So in order to do a, an adequate septoplasty, you're almost always going to have to remove some of this bone to completely remove this deviate, to straighten this deviation and allow the air to flow where it wants to flow. You can also start to appreciate on this cut, the significant contribution that inferior turbinate hypertrophy on the right side is contributing to obstruction on the right, even though the septum is deviated to the left. Here's an even better picture showing that significant inferior turbinate hypertrophy blocking the right side while the septum is blocking the left. To do septoplasty, there are several incisions uh, you can choose. You can, do a, you can use it, do it through a marginal rim incision as part of an external rhinoplasty, through a, a, a hemitransfixion or a full transfixion or through a Killian incision. I prefer a Killian incision in most cases. You elevate subperichondrial periosteal flaps. It's important to preserve an L strut of quadrangular cartilage for uh, columellar and nasal dorsal support. You then basically, underneath your subperiosteal perichondrial flaps, you remove the deviated portions of cartilage and bone. And then the question is, do you crush some of that and put some of that back in as kind of a scaffolding to allow some, uh, some strengthening and some tissue, to, uh, some tissue regrowth, or do you just take it out uh, and just close the septal flaps back together, which uh, many people call a submucous resection which is uh, sort, of a, sort of a variation on the theme of, uh, of septoplasty. You should close either with mattressing suture or with splints or both. And then of course the discussion comes up today about endoscopic versus open septoplasty. Uh, I don't feel strongly about this. Um, we've gotten very good with the endoscopes. You certainly can use the endoscope to, uh, to improve your visualization. However, it's a little bit 
I think, misleading to talk about doing an endoscopic septoplasty because, in fact, you're making the same incision. Uh, you're doing the exact same operation. It's not as if you're you're doing it uh, a minimal operation because you're using the endoscope for a, for a standard septoplasty. The endoscope is a is a tool to enhance visualization, and it's perfectly reasonable to use. In in my uh, in my hands, I don't really use the endoscope for septoplasty uh, routinely. I prefer to have in my hand the speculum or a suction so I can get some retraction and some tension as I as I operate. I can see very well with the headlight um, and and my eyes looking in at the incision and looking inside through the nose. Uh, and the endoscope gives me a pretty view on the screen, but I'm not sure it really helps my visualization or my access. Now, in a very deviated uh, septum, uh, sometimes it's really good for looking back far in the pocket. I'll pull the endoscope out and use it to help my view. But uh, the idea that you're going to pull the endoscope out and try to do the whole operation with the endoscope, I'm not sure it really helps things all that much, but clearly there's people I respect who do septoplasties using the endoscope, and it's a perfectly acceptable uh, technique. Here's, uh, I make the chelate incision, which is about a centimeter back from this caudal edge of the septal cartilage, unless I need to address that portion of the septal cartilage because it's very deviated, in which case I'll make a hemitransfixion incision so I can expose that cartilage. Your L strut is this cartilage like this, uh, the dorsal and uh, caudal cartilage, and then you're going to be removing some portion of quadrangular cartilage, some portion of perpendicular plate of ethmoid, and sometimes some portion of vomer to open up that middle area of the septum, which is the area of, uh, of obstruction of maximum airflow. And here's a picture from the Bailey Atlas from 1996 showing an incision. This looks like a hemitransfixion incision with an elevator in elevating a wide sub, uh, uh, subperichondrial and periosteal pocket before the septoplasty is performed. Now let's talk about the inferior turbinate. Inferior turbinates are very important. They provide surface area for warming, humidification uh, of inhaled air, and it also helps to direct laminar airflow. Hypertrophy can obstruct critical areas for airflow. And hypertrophy is multifactorial. It can be inflammatory, it can be environmental, it can be compensatory, it can be from excessive medication use and rhinitis medicamentosa. So the first thing you should do for inferior, inferior turbinate hypertrophy is try medical treatment. If in fact it's uh, medical inflammation, you can try anti-inflammatories, antihistamines, nasal steroids, et cetera, uh, or other medical topical treatments to see if that will improve the nasal turbinate hypertrophy. If not, uh, if the patient needs surgical reduction, there are several ways to perform surgical reduction of the inferior turbinate. It's important to remember on this drawing down here that the area that's clinically important for nasal airflow is this area right here, the head and this bulbous anterior portion of the inferior turbinate. That's the area that's most likely to block airflow. You can spend a lot of time in the operating room going all the way back in the back of the turbinate, trimming this inferior part of the turbinate down toward the floor and worrying about this turbinate that's in the very posterior portion of the nose, but that's not blocking airflow. Air is flowing above and over that. So that's not a clinically important area. The clinically important area here is this head of the inferior turbinate. You can do a resection, full thickness, mucosa, submucosa, and bone. That's really discouraged and not done very much these days. Um, uh, it causes increasing crusting. Potentially, it causes uh, too much dryness. Uh, and there's really better ways to achieve the same goal without completely removing a portion of the inferior turbinate. You can do an intraturbinate submucosal resection, which is basically removing tissue. Now, there's standard, or it's basically two ways to do that. One is you make an incision and actually dissect inside the tissue. You directly remove bone and submucosal tissue, perhaps remove a little bit of mucosa and then suture the mucosa closed. That's sort of a direct submucosal resection. You can also use the turbinate microdebreeder blades to do microdebreeder assisted resection, where you basically make a stab incision, go in with your microdebreeder, move it in several different planes, in and out, rotating at 360 degrees to basically remove the submucosal tissue. Now you can't, it's very difficult to remove the bone using the microdebreeder, but you can remove a lot of submucosal tissue using the microdebreeder. And we consider that to be a microdebreeder assisted resection. You can also do intraturbinate submucosal reduction. And there's several ways to do that. You can use radio frequency, you can use electrocautery, you can use cold ablation, which is still basically radio frequency just at a colder temperature. These, these uh, techniques all reduce tissue volume, cause fibrosis and cause shrinkage of the terminate. 
One problem with these techniques though is exactly what setting should you use? How much power? For how long? How many passes? So it's difficult to standardize the technique and make sure that you're not doing too much or that you're doing too little. Uh, also, what are the long-term results of simply coagulating or heating the tissue? It certainly causes a short-term result, but the question is, is it gonna be a less effective long-term result as opposed to actually removing the tissue, either using the microdebreeder blade or uh, a, an open incision type of approach? So what's the evidence comparing different techniques of turbinate reduction? Well, there have been a lot of studies on this. In 2016, a systematic review identified 58 studies looking at different ways to perform turbinate reduction. Most of these studies are single arm studies. There are studies that said, I did it this way multiple times and it worked. Um, there's also variable follow-up. Some studies are in the literature reporting uh, outcomes as short as one month after, uh, after the surgery. Most important, there's no standardized outcome assessment. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is because we really didn't have a standardized tool until uh, relatively recently. Most studies show improvement, but most studies don't have a comparative arm. If these authors concluded from looking at all the, all the studies that generally submucosal resection, either manual or microdebreeder, and radio frequency reduction caused the best outcome, best uh, longest duration and lowest complication rate. But they didn't really try to uh, do a meta-analysis and, and pool the data and do a direct comparison. But they found actually all of these results tended to give good outcomes for, uh, for the duration of the study, although some of the studies were very short term and with low complication rates. There was a systematic review with meta-analysis done by Acevedo and colleagues in 2015. They found if you pooled the data, there was no overall difference in subjective or outcomes, uh, objective outcome measures between different techniques by pooling the data. So they similarly found that if you, if you look at the data put together, most techniques seem to work. Again, this is using different, this is pooling the data as much as possible because different outcome measures were used. This is a quote from the paper. The two highest quality papers favored microdebreeder assisted turbinate resection and the reason they favored it was because the results were better long-term. And these are the two studies, Lee and Lee and Pasali et al. And the references here at the bottom of the slide, if you want to look into those studies. Both of those studies, in fact, found that long-term microdebreeder-assisted resection was the best technique. So the bottom line is there's very limited high-quality comparative evidence. Submucosal resection is effective, both short and long-term and submucosal reduction with radio frequency or some other device is also effective. There's probably not that much of a difference between different radio frequency tools. They're all doing very much a similar thing, just at different temperatures or with different delivery devices. There's also no standardized technique, uh, which I find to be a bit of a problem when thinking about doing a radio frequency approach. How much power for how long, how many passes, et cetera. My personal choice is microdebreeder assisted resection. Uh, I can't show that because of a preponderance of strong, high quality evidence, but it certainly makes some clinical sense. Uh, and the limited evidence that's out, th that's out there does tend to indicate that this procedure is perhaps effective for longer than some of the reduction techniques. So I make a small stab incision, make several passes with a 2.9 uh, millimeter microdebreeder blade, and I actually try to remove a lot of tissue to get the turbinate to vis visibly shrink at the time of the procedure, and I find good long term outcomes with that. Next question is, should you do both sides if you're doing a septoplasty? Well, I think the answer to that is, if the turbinate's not hypertrophied, what benefit are you going to get from removing, uh, removing excess tissue? So I think you should, you should do surgery on the hypertrophied side. In many circumstances, with a very deviated septum, one side is actually small. So there's no extra tissue to remove. The other side is quite hypertrophied. If you have one of those S-shaped septal deviations or the septal deviation is perhaps more posterior in both turbinate hypertrophy, do bilateral, uh, bilateral uh, uh, reductions or resections is fine. I select the side I'm gonna do or if I'm gonna do bilateral at the preoperative assessment and I do bilateral if they're both hypertrophy, um, but it's important to not make this assessment intraoperatively. Don't wait till the operating room because when you get the patient decongested, you can't really assess the level of hypertrophy. What's the role of the middle terminate and concha bullosa in, uh, in nasal obstruction? There's surprisingly little data on 
the effect on airflow that a, a contrabilosa has. The, there are some fluid dynamic studies which show that if you have a deviated septum on one side to one side and a contrabilosa on the other, it actually partially equalizes the airflow. And patients who have a deviated septum without a contrabilosa have bigger asymmetry in the flow on the two sides. But there's really no data on the post-op effect of a contrabilosa after septoplasty or on the airflow benefit of reduction of the contrabilosa. Makes some sense given where the air flows that a large contrabilosa probably does contribute to nasal obstruction. So I think it makes sense to address contrabilosa um, if you're worried about nasal obstruction. Uh, but in fact, there's not great evidence uh, demonstrating that. The studies just haven't been done. It's not that the evidence shows it's not effective. We don't have evidence to, to answer the question. Even the role of contrabilosa in sinusitis and sinus surgery is only somewhat better to find because we all know that there's patients who have contrabilosa and no problems. And then there's other patients where the contrabilosa is actually causing anatomic outflow obstruction and needs to be addressed. So the key points in nasal septum and turbinate uh, uh, and nasal obstruction are, you need to assess nasal obstruction using a combination of anatomic evaluation along with reproducible and valid symptom evaluation. And the nose instrument is one validated way to do that. Septal deviation and turbinate hypertrophy are key reasons for nasal obstruction and understanding the physiologic nasal airflow pattern will definitely help your surgical success. Septoplasty is very effective for the treatment of nasal obstruction and so is inferior turbinate reduction. Partial resection and reduction are both effective Resection is probably a little better for long-term outcomes, but that, uh, that is still uh, not fully proven. And finally, the role of the middle turbinate in nasal obstruction is not fully understood. Here's a couple of suggested readings, and I'll put my slides up of some references, uh, which you can uh, take down if you're interested, and these are all papers that I quoted uh, in the study. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Take care.